all right so uh welcome to everyone uh who will be viewing this on youtube and those who are here uh, so let me at this time hand you over to our teacher for tonight uh brother mark all right good night everyone um good night. Just, a, just a little reminder we wouldn't be going through romans as um brother brother sam would have prayed for but we're actually doing james um thank god because um roman has some heavy stuff there um, peter peter says paul writes some stuff that um are hard to understand and people wrestle with yeah romans is one of those books but we're going through james and we're continuing our study to James. Thank God it's a, a much more straightforward and a practical book. Um, we've had three sessions so far. Um, I'm just doing a quick recap for those of you who may not have been here from the start. Um, we're looking at James through the lens of um, it being up for the Christians who would have been dispersed um, from Jerusalem when most likely when they would have been scattered uh, after experiencing persecution. And in my review of the book, it seems as though James was trying to address the, the, the question of, okay, we are Christians, we are believers. What are we supposed to do now? And I believe the direction that James was pointing uh, the believers in is that they have to move on to perfection, that they have to progress to maturity. And the way that they were going to do that is by acquiring wisdom from above. So we looked at uh, the, the, the middle paragraph of the book um, in chapter three, verse uh, 13 to about verse 18. And we looked at that as the kind of uh, central focus in terms of uh, how it is we're going to uh, perfect ourselves and it's by acquiring wisdom that is from above. So in the first class we looked at the fact that wisdom from above would allow us to uh, view trials uh, correctly and help us to appreciate that it's through trials that we are actually perfected. Uh, in, our sec in our third session, we looked at the fact that the wisdom from above would uh, allow us to appreciate what is true religion and that true religion uh, entails, well, it, it, it has to be based on hearing the word so it has to be based on, on faith, um, but not just hear, being hearers of the word, but not just being ready to hear the word, but being a doer of the word as well. And that would produce true religion, which is twofold. It would include keeping oneself unspotted from the world, meaning not being uh, transformed to look like the world, but not being conformed to look like the world, but being transformed uh, to look like Christ. And when we undergo that transformation, it would cause us to uh, treat our fellow man differently. And the other aspect of it would be service to our fellow man. And that's why um, true religion is identified as visiting the, the widows and the fatherless in their affliction, as well as keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, so it's twofold. It's not that we can um, hold on to certain aspects of religion and reject others. It's a, it's a package deal, all right? Today we are going to look at how uh, the wisdom of, from above is going to help us um, judge correctly in terms of uh, our view of people and that issue of partiality and how true love would eliminate that issue of partiality that we would find among us. So we're looking at James chapter two, and we'll be looking at verse one to 13 today. And I'm reading from the English standard version. So the word of God says from verse one, my brothers, Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or 
sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which has been promised, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as though as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment without mercy, for judgment is without mercy, sorry, to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, James here is highlighting uh, one of the, 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 the hardest things to combat um, in our human nature, and that is uh, prejudging on judging by external circumstance and judging by appearance. Now, what I want us to appreciate is our judgment reveals things about character. And James highlights in a verse, uh, that's verse four. He said, if it is you, you are performing these actions whereby you are making judgments about people and treating them uh, based on how you judge them. He asked the question, have you not then made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, the scenario that he paints here, he's saying a poor man comes in with shabby clothing and you treat him a particular way. You say, all right, you go sit down there on the ground or you, you sit at my feet. But a, a, a rich man or an influential person comes in and you give him preferential treatment. What James is saying is that behavior reveals your true intention. So let, let me see if I can um, translate it to terms we can understand. So let's say a vagrant comes into the assembly or someone who you, are, you know is accustomed coming to beg for things. You may see them as a nuisance. You may, you may want to avoid them. You may want to um, not have much to do with them and you treat them in a particular way. But let's say uh, a politician were to come into the assembly, minister a house in that city, and everybody wants a house. So they try to make them feel welcome and make them feel comfortable. Uh, and they try to get in their good graces. Now, what that behavior does is it highlights where our priorities are. If it is we are treating uh, people who can do things for us better than those who we can do things for, we are basically exposing that we have a selfish nature, that we are concerned with more of how we can be served than how we can serve others. And the issue with partiality is that it contradicts um, 
God's design in terms of how he created human beings. Because God created mankind in his image and his likeness. So at the very least, we have to put each and every individual as someone who has been created in the image and likeness of God. That's supposed to be the basis, the foundation of how we treat each and every individual, that this person is created in the image and likeness of God. And that's why um, it is morally wrong to murder another human being, but it's not morally wrong to kill an animal and eat an animal because animals were created for our sustenance. When uh, God created the earth, he said, I created all, uh, all the trees of the, of the, all the fruit bearing trees for food and all the animals for food for man. So the animals were created with that purpose to sustenance to man. But man was created in God's image and likeness. So if it is we don't respect our fellow man as a fellow individual who was created in God's image and likeness, God takes issue with that. And it is not just uh, going to the extreme of murder. But any ill treatment towards God's creation, who he has created in his image and his likeness, he takes issue with. So when James highlights that you may think that you're not, you're not breaking one of the major commandments, but he, he lumps the law together and he's saying, if you break one of the aspects of the law, you are in contradiction of the law, a body of law. And then he points to the overarching law, the royal law, which he calls it, that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, I want us to, to go back to where that, that commandment was given. And that was given in, in Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, I want us to take from verse 9 and come all the way down to verse 18. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9, going down to verse 18. And I want us to, 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 to take note of the lengths to which God went to describe exactly how we should treat our fellow human beings. And this was given as a direct instruction to the children of Israel. And we know that the law that was given in Leviticus was the law that governed the land. So there was no separation between, as we have it today, church and state. So God's law was the law that governed how the Israelites lived their daily lives. And here's, here's what um, God gives as the law of how they were to treat with each other. Verse 9 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not strip the vineyard bare, Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the sojourner. I am the Lord, your God. Now, we just dealt with last week that true religion, pure religion, undefiled religion, was to one, keep yourself unspotted from the wood, but also to visit the widows and the fatherless in their affliction. And now we see built into God's law was a provision for those who may not have the ability to provide for themselves, the poor and the sojourner. So when an Israelite owned a field and they, they, they would have uh, received a harvest from that field, 
they were not supposed to pick every single thing from the field. They were supposed to set aside a portion, and this is beside their tithes that they would give directly to God. They were to set aside a portion, and God instructed exactly which portion they were supposed to set aside. The edges of the field and everything that fell to the ground, they were supposed to leave them. And it would make it easy. For, so after the, the, the reapers pass through and they, they, they reap the harvest, the sojourners, those who were uh, visitors in the land, who were traveling through, who may not have any uh, possessions and, and uh, have a way to earn a living, they could easily pass by the edge of a field and get things to eat, to survive. And then similar, they could walk through the rows of the field and pick up what would have fallen on the ground. Now, this, when, when, I, when I appreciated the lengths God went through to make sure that the poor and the sojourner were taken care of, I realized that it was intrinsic in his design of, of humanity. And Jesus made the statement when, um, if you all remember the, the, the scene uh, with the woman and the alabaster box, and when she broke it and she, she poured it on Jesus' feet, Judas was wondering to himself, why didn't she um, sell it and give the money to the poor? And Jesus made the statement, the poor you will always have with you. And something about that statement resonated with me. Because I often wondered if there was a way to eliminate poverty on the whole, to make sure that there was nobody in the world that would have need, uh, that, that would be in, in dire need of, of food and clothing and those kind of things. But then I, I, I thought to myself, if that were the case, then there would be no opportunity for us to show compassion. So this world is designed in such a way that there will be always people that are in need that we would always have the opportunity to show compassion to. And it's supposed to be built into our structure as God's people. And we're supposed to make provisions for attending to the needs of the poor. So one way that I have tried to, to uh, emulate this in my life, when I, when I um, make a purchase and I might have some singles from that purchase, I would stash it in a little pocket in my car. And you see those people who would, would look by the, the traffic lights um, and outside of malls and outside of the, the, the ATMs, that would, I would reserve that for them. Now, I, in, in time past, I used to think to myself, you know what? I don't know what they're going to use this for. Maybe they're going to use it to buy a cigarette. Maybe they're going to use it to buy drugs. And then I realized, I started to reason like that. I am making myself a judge. And I had to ask myself, what does God require of me? And what he requires of me is to give to them that ask of you and to him that would borrow to not away. So God would have to deal with those and what they do with what they are given. But he's also going to deal with me when it is somebody would have asked me of me something and it was within my power to help and I did not. So built in in God's plan and God's scheme of things is the care of those who are less fortunate, the poor. So, and this is the thing, when the poor man came into the assembly, it should have been seen as, this is an opportunity for us to show love, an opportunity for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. But instead, James is saying, there may be instances where some people see them as a hindrance. And it ties in beautifully with uh, one of the first principles we looked at in terms of looking at the uh, wisdom in, 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 in looking at trials and different circumstances. 
where he says that the, the lowly brother should exalt, should rejoice in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. And here's how that, that, that idea is brought out beautifully. When it is, the lowly brother, is, his needs are taken care of by the, the rest of the church. And they, are now, they have now built themselves to a point where they are self-sustaining. They can now rejoice in that and say, this is the design of God. God this, uh, would have expected it to be that one person could, could, could progress from a state where they are in need, and now they may be in a position to help someone else who is in need. So the, the wisdom from above would help us to see that the, the, the poor and the needy that we come into contact with, first of all, they also are made in the image of, and likeness of God, and we should treat them as such. Also, that we should see it as an opportunity to show genuine love and to, to, uh, to portray the, 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 to execute the design that God would have intended. So we continue on in Leviticus and we add verse, verse 11. Verse 11 says, you shall not steal, you shall not deal false, you shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Now this deals with uh, our dealing with our fellow man and their possessions and their trust. When you steal from someone, you are robbing them of what they have worked hard for when you have not worked for it. When you lie to someone, you are deceiving them and robbing them of the truth. And he's saying also, you should not swear, for, for, swear by his name falsely. Don't bring his name into, um, into covenants that you, you, you don't intend to keep. Uh, trying to, to back up your, your, your falsehood um, in the name of, of being an advocate for God. He's saying, don't do that at all because you are you are perversing your relationship with your fellow man when you do those things. Continuing on, verse 13 says, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall, re shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. So again, he's, he's dealing with very specific circumstances of people who um, maybe they have different challenges in life. And those challenges may be exploited. Uh, and some people may even find joy in, in, in doing these wicked things. And God is saying, don't do that. And he's saying, the reason you're, you're not going to do that is out of fear for me. Because those people who are blind, those people who are, who are, um, who are deaf, they too are created in the image and the likeness of God. So you treat them well out of respect for God. Continuing in verse 15, it says, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Now, and this is, this is a concept that, um, that may be difficult for people to wrap their mind around. The, the, the scripture does not, does not outright um, condemn judging. It condemns judging without, uh, without the right standard. So when we, when we are judging, we have to judge righteous judgment. So when he says, do not be partial to the poor and defer to the great, 
but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. He is giving us the standard by which we ought to judge. So some people may, may make the claim, only God could judge me. And I think they're, they're, they're making that claim about final judgment. And that, that may be true. But we are, are called to make certain judgments here on earth. But that judgment has to be guided by righteousness. And the, 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 the fundamentals of our judgment be, first of all, that each and every individual is created in the image and likeness of God. So our judgment has to be tempered by the fact that we respect God first of all, and we respect each other based on the fact that we are created, uh, and the, the person that we are dealing with is created in the image of and likeness of God, just like us. So that, that's just a by the way there, that in the, in the instances where we are called to judge, we have to judge righteous judgment, so that righteousness has to be the standard by which you judge. This is an interesting one in verse 17. And we're coming down to the, the, the statement that, that kind of ties all of these together. It says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, James identified the royal law as you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, based on, based on the, the structuring of the sentence, it's saying that loving your neighbor as yourself is in contradiction to the things that were stated above. What is that contrasting conjunction? And it says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And I think in verse 17, it highlights where bearing a grudge and vengeance starts. So he gives the, the remedy. He gives the... the, the, the uh, the way that we prevent it, and we know that uh, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. He gives the, the, the method in which we are to prevent ourselves from falling into that trap of holding grudges and, and um, taking vengeance. He says in verse 17, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but Reason frankly with your neighbor. How many times do we neglect to confront people about the things that bother us a lot? And here's the interesting thing. Lest you incur sin because of him. Here's what the wisdom of God is saying. When it is we neglect to address things and we let it fester and we don't reason frankly with our neighbor, it quickly, or sometimes not quickly, sometimes slowly over time, it would degenerate into hate for that brother or resentment. Maybe we're more comfortable with the term resentment. Something they would have, somebody would have done or something you would have heard somebody did and we resent people instead of reasoning frankly with our neighbor. And when we don't do that, we may be inclined to hold and when we hold grudges, we may be inclined to take vengeance. But here's what God says. God says that vengeance belongs to me. 
So when it is we hold grudges and we take vengeance, we directly contradict, we directly disobey God's instructions where he says, if uh, a brother does something against you, you ought to rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. We, we throw that out of the window. And when it is we seek to take justice into our own hands, we throw out the window that God uh, is the one who is responsible for executing judgment and vengeance. And we make a mess of things. And I find it so interesting that all those things are wrapped up into that royal law that we shall love our neighbor as ourselves. And we talked about judgment a little earlier. And before he wraps up this chapter, um, in verse 12 and 13 of James chapter 2, he says to speak and act as though we are going to be judged under the law of, of liberty. And then he gives a warning that judgment without mercy, that judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. So remember we talked about the fact that if we do judge that we ought to, we ought to judge righteous judgment, if we judge a judgment that is not righteous, we have to, to be aware that that is the way that we are going to be judged. And that's why the scripture says, judge not lest you be judged. Meaning the same way, the same standard that we use to judge other people, that is the standard that is going to be used to judge us. So this is our, whatever standard you're, you're using to judge people, be prepared to be judged by that same standard. So if you can't live up to the standard that you are judging people by, you might want to reconsider the standard that you're judging people by. But he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. We, when we examine um, how Jesus would have dealt with the people of his day, It's not that he was tolerant of sin. It's not that he was encouraging of sin. But he understood that in order for people to change, they have to be given the opportunity to change. So sometimes we are quick to judge a situation or a person. But we don't appreciate the fact that unless that person is given the opportunity to change, it would be very difficult for them to do that. And that's why I believe in God's wisdom, he gave the instructions when our brother does something against us, somebody does something that we don't like, our responsibility is to rebuke them. And if they repent, then our responsibility is to forgive them. Now, I want to, to, to clear up something right here. The, the scripture does not give... Uh, 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 what do you call it? A, 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 a lag period between that act of repentance and forgiveness. So if it is, let's say, Trovel mashes my tool. Literally, he mashes my tool. I can, option E, I cannot tell him about it and I can be angry about it and I could storm off and say, you know what, this man mashed my toe, but how, how he could do that? Meanwhile, Trevor probably didn't even know he mashed my toe, but I hear I there venting and, and, and this thing festering inside of me. Or he could mash my toe and say, hey, Trevor, let's mash my toe. 
And he now has the opportunity to acknowledge what he did. And he can apologize and say, well, all right, I'll be more careful next time. And I, in that instance, I'm supposed to forgive him. Now, there's a common misconception that we are, are called to forgive and forget. I want to make it abundantly clear that I see that principle nowhere in scripture. That principle of forgiving and forgetting is nowhere to be found in scripture. What I do find in scripture is that when God forgives us, he says, their sins I will remember no more. Now, you might say, Brother Mark, been forgetting and not remembering. I'll tell you the difference. I'm glad you asked. Forgetting is something you do by mistake. Let me, let me see by a raise of hands, anybody who has ever actively tried to forget something and succeeded. Anybody? Has anybody ever consciously forgotten something? Any? No? All right. Because forgetting, Leah, you've, you've consciously forgotten something. You had, you had to teach me how to do that. <laughs> Good night. It, it, it's something that I literally wanted to forget. Mm -hmm. So over time, I would have recreated the story so many times in my mind that mm -hmm. I actually lost what the reality of it was. So mm -hmm. a few years later, someone literally had to restructure that story because when, by the time I was finished with it, it, it was nothing close to the original event. Right. It was something traumatic. So I just kept changing different parts of it over time till eventually it became so obscure that I couldn't even remember what mm -hmm. actually did happen. That's an interesting case. That's an interesting case. Now, all right. That, that circumstance aside, because I think what you're describing um, is, is, a, is a mechanism of the brain. Um, and what, what I'm actually getting at is the act of, or the, the phenomenon of forgetting is a deficiency in memory. So you, you forget things uh, when they maybe are no longer um, useful to you. Your brain is an is a, is a, is a in, the intricate um, design supercomputer that it's, it takes what it needs and it, it, it throws away what it doesn't. But what I'm getting at is the, the act of not remembering is a conscious choice. So I'm going back to the example that Travel may have mashed my toe and he apologized and we could get past that. I may still feel the pain but I can say, you know what? I'm not going to call this to remembrance anymore. It's not that I do not have the ability to call it to remembrance, but I'm making a conscious decision not to bring it to remembrance anymore. So I believe the, the way that God intends for us to forgive is just like how he does it, where he forgives and he makes a conscious choice not to remember that, that, um, that transgression anymore. So we're not actively replaying it in our minds uh, over and over and over and letting it affect um, how we deal with each other. Um, what I was dealing with in, in terms of the concept of forgive and forget, sometimes we try to, or people would try to, suggest that is the way 
that we ought to forgive. And what I'm seeing is, I think it's something that doesn't, that doesn't happen like that. When, when uh, someone does something to us, especially if it's hurtful, it may be very difficult to forget it, but it is very possible not to bring it to remembrance because that's a conscious choice. That's something we have control over. Now, I think Sister Denise had a hand up and I want to take that before I, I go over into another a train of thought if she still has that coming. Sister Denise? All right, she probably didn't want to make that comment anymore. So, um, What I'm getting at is there's an instance where Jesus, uh, Peter asked Jesus a question. He says, okay, how many times do I forgive my brother if it is he does something? Is seven times enough? Um, for Peter, that's, that's probably enough chances to give somebody. Now, Jesus turns around and says, no, I don't tell you seven times is enough. I say, 70 times seven. And he'll go a step further. He say, if your brother does something wrong to you seven times in the same day, and seven times you rebuke him, and seven times you repent, you have to forgive him all seven times. Now, that's why I say there's no lag in between um, repentance and forgiveness. So there should be no lag between repentance and forgiveness because let me ask you a question. When we repented of our sins and we confess Christ and we were baptized into Christ, was there a lag between our repentance and God's forgiveness? No, there wasn't. It was immediate. So the, the same way that God forgives that's the same way he is expecting us to forgive. So it makes it a lot uh, more practical and doable when we do it God's way instead of the way that, that men would, would try to portray uh, the, the act of forgiveness. And we're looking at the fact that James is often contrasting um, heavenly wisdom and, and earthly wisdom. It may sound good when we say, well, forgive and forget, but it's not practical. It's not, um, I would dare say it's not, it's not uh, possible. But God is saying, forgive and remember no more, which I believe is, is practical. It is within our power to say, even though this thing was done against me, I am not going to hold it against this other person and I'm not going to let it affect our relationship. Now I'm going back to the example that I used. If it is, I would want to take vengeance into my own hands in that scenario. So um, let's say that but I trivial mash my toe. And he, I rebuke him. I say, well, trivial, you mash my toe there. And he doesn't acknowledge it and he doesn't repent. I say, well, now nah, that, that could not be me. I didn't mash it. I didn't feel nothing. I could now decide, well, you not, you're not taking accountability for your actions. So, I'm going to make you take accountability for that. And I decide I'm going to mash his toe back. Now, this is, <laughs> this is something that, that it, it may sound like a, a primary school squabble, but it manifests itself, itself in, 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 our, in our adult relationships, and I'll show you why. So I might say, okay, I'm going to mash back Travel's too. And then when I mash Travel's too, if Travel is not mature enough, he will say, well, he's going to take vengeance into his own hands and he's going to do something that he believes is fair. And then I might think that his reaction was not called for and then I may react to his reaction. And that's how things spiral out of hand. And if it is we examine where relationships break down, 
That's the spiral. Someone does something and we don't leave vengeance or judgment to God. We take matter in our own hands and we say, okay, this is what I believe should be done to this person because they done, have done this thing to me. And that's not judging righteous judgment. And that's not allowing vengeance to be in the hands of God. That's taking matters into our own hands. And the problem with that is that we are not qualified to execute vengeance or judgment. We're not qualified to do that. Because how do I know what is the fair retaliation for that, for that action that was done to me? I don't. I may think, well, he mashed my toe, I'm going to mash him back. But I don't know if I mash him harder than he mashed me. His would have, may, may have been by accident. Mine is now intentional. So in, in dealing with our fellow man, it is, it is vitally important that we respect God's design because we end up into a world of problems when we, when we step into um, trying to figure things out of, and in terms of how we should do things uh, based on our own reasoning. And it is, it is mind boggling when you look at major, major disagreements and you, you, I, I don't know if anybody's ever done this. So you reach a point in an in argument or a disagreement where it's really bad and you try to trace back to where this thing started. Sometimes you, you can't even find the point. And in the rare occasions that you do find the point that, that the disagreement started, it's something so trivial and insignificant compared to the escalation of, of the situation. And here God is saying, the way that we can avoid um, taking vengeance, the way that we can avoid holding grudges is to speak to our brothers frankly and openly and don't, don't have a hate for our brothers in our hearts. And when we do that, that's how we are loving our neighbors ourselves. Because if we're, if we're holding, um, harboring hate in our hearts, if it is where we are holding grudges, then we are not loving each other as God prescribed us to love each other. Now, the instruction or the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves was an instruction under the law of Moses. And I want to, to let us know we have an even better instruction now. And that's why Jesus would say, a new commandment I give to you, that you love each other as I have loved you. So the, the standard under the law of Moses would have been to love each other the way that we love ourselves. But the issue with that is I may not know how to love myself. I may not know how to uh, treat with the other person because I don't know how I'm supposed to treat myself. But Jesus being the fulfillment of the law, he now demonstrates perfectly how we are to love each other, how we are to serve each other, and if necessary, how we are to lay down our lives for each other. And now he can make the statement, I am the standard. So if you want to know how to love your fellow man, you just have to look at how I have loved you. And you can pattern yourself after my actions. You can pattern yourselves and you can, you can make distinctions. And when I look at Jesus, even in, in circumstances where um, judgments could have been made, he chose not to. 
And I believe that's a demonstration of mercy uh, being triumphant over judgment. So there was an instance where a woman was caught in adultery and the people tried to, to catch Jesus and he brought them, uh, they brought her before Jesus. And the woman was caught in adultery. What are we supposed to do with him? What are we supposed to do with her, sorry? What does the law of Moses say? Now, everyone knew, Jesus knew and they knew that the law of Moses instructed that this, the woman should be stoned. But Jesus turned around and said, well, you who are without sin, you cast the first stone. And Jesus being a fulfillment of the law, he was pointing to the fact that their motives weren't pure because they knew also that the law said the person who would have caught them in the act, they were supposed to take them to the priest and testify to the priest that the, the person was caught in the act and the man and the woman was supposed to be um, brought to the, to, the, to the priest. And when it is the priest and the, the, the act of judgment was reserved for the priest and scenario, when the priest made the judgment that they should be stoned, it was on the testimony of the person who saw also that a person could not be stoned or put to death outside of the testimony of two agreeing parties. And the agreeing parties who are testifying, they were, the, they were supposed to be the person to throw the first stone in the stoning. So they took responsibility for following through the commandment that was given by God. And when it is Jesus said, you without sin cast the first stone, now they have to think, okay, did we do the right thing? When we, um, when we bring this person to Jesus, instead of you know, um, taking the man and the woman and carrying them to the priest, and well, the person who catched them, they were supposed to throw the first stone. And they now have to uh, basically start this process. So what Jesus did is he, he revealed that they weren't concerned about upholding the law. They weren't concerned about preserving uh, the, the uh, not profaning the, 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 the congregation of Israel. They weren't concerned about that. If they were, they would have approached this in the right way. And in instances like that, I believe is where Mercy is supposed to triumph. Where it is we have to judge a situation for what it is and not because sometimes people may be calling on us to make a judgment. But we, first of all, to judge a righteous judgment, you can't make a judgment without all the facts. And if it is we don't have the facts, then a lot of times we're not qualified to make the judgment. And many times, the only person who all the facts is God. Many times we have enough facts to make uh, a wise judgment. But often we have to leave room for God to work. And that's, that's, the, that's the space where mercy exists. So in dealing with our fellow man, first of all, we have to appreciate and just recapping here, that we are created in God's image and God's likeness. And the way we treat each other would reveal things about our nature. If it is we are, um, if it is we are shunning the poor, we are not seeing our opportunity to serve. If it is we are trying to, to gain favor with the rich, we're not trusting in God, we're trusting in uh, gaining favor with those people and we, we, are, ex we are exposing that we have evil intentions. We are just seeking what people can do for us. But we are called not to show partiality, but to uphold the royal law, which is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And in order to do that, we have to treat each other as God intended. And part of that is it, 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 to, to eliminate the, the ill treatment, it has to start with how we view each other. And oftentimes what, what, uh, 
what causes ill treatment of, of each other is the, the, the negative views we have of each other. And those negative views are often caused by things we are harboring and that we have not expressed, that we have not frankly discussed, that we have not brought to the, to the, to the fore and allowed people the opportunity to address the issue. And allowing opportunity to make things right, that is the aspect of judgment where mercy is allowed room. So before a judgment is made, someone has to be given the opportunity to make things right. Because we would want that same opportunity. And we have been given that opportunity by God. And we should allow others to have that opportunity. All right, so um, we are just about out of time. We have about two minutes. Um, any questions in that two minutes? Sister Denise, I saw you had a hand up earlier and you took it down. You remember the question? Yes, Sister Denise, you could go ahead. Right, I said, um, I had my hand up earlier, but it was just a comment I was going to make and I didn't need to afterwards because okay. I was also finishing a class. So, uh, right, right. <laughs> no, but I was just, <laughs> I was just thinking um, that we have to get comfortable with a process, with the process of speaking the truth in love. We have to get comfortable with it and we have to become authentic with it. In, in, by that, I mean that one, we have to ensure that there is love and two, mm -hmm. we have to ensure that we are speaking the truth. It's hard to do, but it's also hard to hear. Yeah. So that the person who's hearing it needs to be sure that this is done, being done in love. And the person who's doing it has to make sure that they're doing it in love and that it is the truth. Mm -hmm. you know but it is a process that we should you know sometimes i think that there are some standards um that the bible is giving us that we kind of overlook mm -hmm. you know and this is one i would really like to see us um really work at because it, it takes a lot of work even i think even in a, um, with a married couple who swore to love each other mm -hmm. it's difficult you know, to speak the truth at all. You have, sometimes you feel like you have to tread carefully and you do sometimes, right? But um, we have to be more committed to speaking the truth in love and not one or the other, but both. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if I agree that we have to become comfortable with it, but I would say we have to make it a habit because I'm gonna be honest. Speaking the truth is oftentimes an uncomfortable thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of those uncomfortable things that are necessary. Mm -hmm. And the uncomfortable things that are necessary, what we have to do with those is do them even though we don't want to do them until they become a habit. Mm -hmm. It's like trying to get in shape. Mm -hmm. The first time you get up to exercise and not going to want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you may never get comfortable with it, but it will become a habit where mm -hmm. the, the initial struggle um, may not be as, as, as difficult over time. And then mm -hmm. you, you become, you, you become um, You, 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 you start to like the results of it. Mm. You may not always, always like the process of it, but when you, when, you, when you begin to make it a habit, you see the results it produces and you, 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 you fall in love with the results, not necessarily the process. And, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the power of habits because it's the practice of doing uncomfortable things over and over and over because we want the results right so it becomes I, I just, easier to do mm -hmm. um 
but we have to we have to be real that it's it's it may be an uncomfortable process in at the start and i just want to make a plug there that we had some homework for last week um in terms of being doers of the word and not only hearers to identify principles um that we may be identifying that could be practically applied so i'm seeing that this is one that you 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 may want to to expound on in that last class content mm -hmm. Yeah, right. But but yeah. you know, for me, the focus is the love part, eh? mm -hmm. because I feel like a lot of our practices would be so much easier if we focus on the love. Yeah, Definitely. you know, but because even like with raising children is something that about speaking the truth in love. It's not just it it it, it is yes uncomfortable, but when you think about the fact that it's going to keep the child from harm. It's mm -hmm. going to, you know, be the best, better thing in the long run and all of that. And you right. come from that place where out of, of concern, right. it becomes easier to speak the truth. Because you're concerned with the results. It's, it's like, right. um, and you can concerned about the person too. Mm -hmm. You're concerned right. about the person and you're concerned that the person achieves the best. Yeah. Right? So that, that we have to try to incorporate that with each other. So when I tell you something and I say, well, you know, you need to be more polite or whatever, you know, I'm not saying it because I want you to feel bad, mm -hmm. but I'm saying it because I have a genuine concern about your development, you know, and I'm saying that, you know, if you may be hurting some people that are not aware of it. So if you just consciously work on that, you know, it might smooth out ears. I don't even have to tell you all those areas that it will smooth up. But mm -hmm. I'm seeing that, you know, if you could become a little gentler, you yeah. know, that your influence will be so much better. So, but you have to be, you have to trust that when I tell you be more polite, that I am looking, I am concerned about your best interest. Mm -hmm. If that so, doesn't come, you might feel a little slighted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that 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 openness and that frankness and that speaking the truth, it has to go both ways for it to work. And 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 as you're speaking, um, I'm playing out scenarios in my. I'm looking at okay, let's say, I have an issue, right? I need to be told the issue, for mm -hmm. me to have the opportunity to address the issue. So, someone tells me the issue. The intention is the best intention for me that they, they want to see me grow, they want to see me develop. Mm -hmm. However, the, the way they may have brought about the issue may not have been the best. Mm -hmm. Now, what may happen is um, I could receive it, but I may not address with them the way they told me about it. Mm -hmm. So as, that's why I say the openness has to go the, both ways because here it is. I now have an opportunity to say, well, you know, you, you made a really good point. Um, I do see how changing this would, would make me a better person. However, I, I really think that you could have brought it in a better way and you probably make a suggestion of how they could have brought it in a better way. Mm -hmm. That might be seen as deflecting um, mm -hmm. based on how it's done. But mm -hmm. if, if it is done and, and both parties are mature enough, both of them grow. Mm -hmm. Because now I know what I need to work on. And now you have a better way of approaching me and others that may have a similar issue. Mm -hmm. So we, we rob each other of growth when we don't address things. Mm -hmm. no, um, no matter how, how insignificant it might seem. Right. And, and I understand that. Eh? <laughs> Thinking about a particular example where... Uh, a beloved sister told me, um, no matter what people say about you, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so because, you know, I, I took it on the chin and all of that, but it was a mm -hmm. little, it was a bit of a sore point, yeah. um, but I understood that she loved me and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that how much it... It was, a, it was an irritation. It was not a major irritation, but it was a mm -hmm. little bit of an irritation. She yeah. did it three times before I told her about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I think 
it, telling her didn't stop her from doing it. Mm -hmm. Telling her gave me an opportunity to voice how I felt about it. Right. That was what helped. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, some people, even when you tell them something, they, they might be a little too, either too old and set in their ways or whatever to really be able to change it um, mm -hmm. quickly. <laughs> so you have to put up with it. But saying something, being honest and saying something really helps you to let it go. And, and it comes back to, to the principle that I, that I always default to, um, which is what does God require of me mm -hmm. in a situation? So it's, if it is, um, he says, if, if a brother um, does something to offend you, to rebuke them, okay, well, mm -hmm. somebody does something to offend me, God is expecting to rebuke them, okay, I told them about it. Um, then he says, if they repent, forgive them. Mm -hmm. so, okay, what about if they don't repent? Then he says, well, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about continuing to love the person and, right. and treat them the best you could. So in, 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 any, in any circumstance, um, I, I find it useful to ask myself, what does God require of me? Mm -hmm. and, and not focus too much on um, what the other person is supposed to do <laughs> to make the process right. smoother. Um, because God is not going to hold me account for the actions. He's going to hold mm -hmm. me account. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I think that's about all we have time for. Do join us again next week uh, for the latter half of chapter two.